Welcome! This is the Rule Fundamentals module from the Level 1 Officiating Clinic. This video is an important primer on the rules for new officials. And while it has been designed for new officials, you might also be watching this video as a coach or player for your professional development. We welcome you, too. This video is designed to teach you the basic fundamental rules of ringette, but you should know that this module describes the basic rules as simply as possible. There are often exceptions or nuances above and beyond what is presented here. A complete understanding of the rules of ringette will come as you develop through the certification pathway, but you can accelerate your development by reading the rulebook, asking more experienced partners and supervisors questions, and attending professional development sessions such as the webinars delivered by ringette Canada. Let's start with the most basic fundamentals of ringette. Each team may have a maximum of 18 players, but a team must be able to ice a minimum of seven players to start the game. At any point in a game, a team cannot play more than six players at once, and once the game has started, they must be able to ice a minimum of four players, otherwise they forfeit the game. If enough players are penalized at the same time, it is possible that a team could have four or more players, but would not be able to ice all four. The normal makeup of the team on the ice is five skaters and one goalkeeper. In each end zone, there is a restricted area demarcated by the free play line and the end boards behind the net. Only three skaters per team may play in this restricted area in most cases. Blue lines separate the defending zone, neutral zone, and attacking zones. Players must pass the ring over each blue line which is to say, the last player who contacted the ring before the ring crosses a blue line may not contact or control the ring until someone else does. Passing the ring over both blue lines is not allowed. A team may not make a direct pass from their defending zone to their attacking zone. The ring must be contacted or controlled in the neutral zone prior to entering the attacking zone. The blue lines are neutral. A ring on or touching the blue line can be played by any player on the ice, even the player who put it there. If the player who put the ring on the blue line plays it, they must be sure not to be contacting or controlling the ring when it is no longer on the blue line and has entered the next zone. The crease is prohibited to any player other than the goalkeeper. Only the goalkeeper may contact or control a ring that is within or contacting the goal crease. This screen is a bit of a misnomer. Touching does matter in some cases, but throughout a ringette game, decisions to stop the play are made based on control, not on touch. During the game, control of the ring transfers from player to player and team to team based on who has the ring on their stick or who is passing the ring in one way or another. Play is stopped immediately if the team in control of the ring commits an infraction. If the team not in control of the ring commits an infraction, we will wait until they get the ring to stop play, but only if the infraction still exists or a five second count is ongoing. So those were the basic fundamentals. Now we'll get into some of the nitty gritty. We'll begin by defining the markings, zones, and areas on the ice surface. This is the blank canvas that is the ice rink. Every game begins with a free pass to the visiting team. And in order to have a free pass, we need to have free pass circles. There are five free pass circles around the rink, one in the neutral zone and two in either end zone. When you're placing the ring, you should always place it in the circle nearest to the ring when you stopped play. In order for the game to progress, we need zones, and the zones are demarcated by the blue lines. In ringette, the ring must be passed to another player over each blue line. When play enters an end zone, it becomes further restricted. The free play lines demarcate the restricted areas. Only certain players are allowed to play within a restricted area. And finally, in order to score, we need to have a net and a goal line. And we also add in the crease to keep the goalie safe from injury. The goalkeeper is the only player allowed to enter the crease in most cases. With everything drawn out now, let's highlight some key sections of the ice. First, we have the neutral zone, also known as the center zone. The game begins here. 
When a goal is scored, the ring is always returned here to resume play. Every player on the ice is allowed to play the ring in the neutral zone. The end zones of the ice are referred to as the attacking or defending zones. The team that has the ring determines which moniker we use for the zone. If the team defending the net has the ring, we call it the defending zone. If the team trying to score has the ring, we call it the attacking zone. With the exception of the attacking team's goalkeeper, every other player may play the ring in these zones. And finally, we have the restricted areas. Each end zone has a restricted area demarcated by a free play line. In general, only three skaters and the defending goalkeeper may play within each restricted area. Now that we understand the makeup of the ice surface, we'll explore the required equipment for players. For a skater, the following equipment is required. The helmet, which should be CSA approved. The neck guard, which should be BNQ certified. Protective gloves on the hands. Elbow pads. Hip, tailbone, and pelvic protection, often in the form of a girdle. Shin pads skates, and a ringette stick. A player stick must pass under her armpit while standing on the ice in skates. All padding must be worn under the clothes, like their pants or their jersey, and the on-ice official is not expected to validate that equipment worn under the clothing is there or within the rules. For the goalkeeper, the required equipment is the helmet, which should be CSA approved, a neck guard, which should be BNQ certified, the chest protector, protective gloves, which might be in the form of a catcher or might be in the form of a blocker, goal pads, a goal stick, and skates. And like a player, all their padding must be worn under their clothes with the exception of their goalkeeper pads. Additionally, a goalkeeper should have leg coverings to cover her exposed skin behind her goal pads. In ringette, a free pass is used to start play at the beginning of each period and after some stoppages in play. The free pass is awarded to the visiting team in the neutral zone to start the game. This free pass award then alternates between the home and visiting team in preceding periods. In stoppages where the ring is awarded to the defending team in their defending zone, play will most often start with a goalkeeper ring. In a free pass, the ring is placed in the center of the half of the free pass circle closer to the goal area defended by the team awarded the free pass. Any eligible player to play in the current zone may take the free pass. This player is the only player permitted inside the free pass circle and must remain inside their half of the circle until the ring has completely exited. Upon blowing the whistle, the on-ice official begins a five-second count. The player must pass the ring with their stick entirely outside of the circle within those five seconds. The player taking the free pass must remain inside their half of the circle until the ring exits. They may not be the first player to contact or control the ring following the pass. Most defending zone free passes are replaced by a goalkeeper ring. Exceptions include player injury, penalty assessment, when a ring completely leaves the enclosed area of the surface, boards, and netting, or if a timeout is taken during the stoppage in play. As soon as the goalkeeper has control of the ring inside the goal crease, the net official should blow their whistle and begin a five-second count. During this count, the goalkeeper must put the ring into play outside of the crease by throwing, batting, legally kicking, or passing with their stick. The goalkeeper may not be the first player to contact or control the ring following the pass. It is the on-ice official's responsibility to stop play when the rules require it. You should blow your whistle to stop play any time a goal is scored, the ring can't be played, for example, it leaves the playing surface. A player is injured. Or there is a violation or penalty, and the violating team has or gets control of the ring. 
For this reason, it's crucial that you understand how control of the ring is defined. Control occurs any time a player puts their stick in the ring, propels the ring with their stick or kicks or bats the ring, or any time that the ring comes to rest inside the goal crease. Moving on, we'll discuss goal scoring. A goal is scored any time the ring completely crosses the goal line between the goal posts, so long as the ring is shot into the net from anywhere on the ice, the ring is shot and deflected off of a player or on-ice official into the net, the ring is legally kicked or batted and then deflected into the net by any player other than the defending goalkeeper, or the ring is directed into the net in any way by a defending player. If a goal is scored as we just discussed, but before the ring crosses the goal line, the attacking team commits a violation, for example, going in the crease, or if the attacking team commits a penalty, or if an on-ice audible occurs for any reason, like if the game clock buzzer sounds, or the shot clock goes off, or an on-ice official blows their whistle, the goal is nullified, which is to say it's not counted. The referee is the sole authority in making this decision, but they might rely on their minor officials to help them decide at critical points of a game where the clock is running down and the crowd noise might make hearing the clock buzzer impossible. When a goal is scored, the back official, the official on the free play line, is responsible for reporting the goal and the assists. The goal is credited to the last attacking team player to contact the ring before the ring crossed the goal line. Up to two assists may be credited, and the assists go to the two or fewer players who contacted or controlled the ring immediately before the goal scorer in the time since the defending team last had control of the ring. Now we'll discuss violations. Violations are rule infractions that could result in possession of the ring changing from one team to another. Some examples of violations include someone going in the crease, having four skaters in a restricted area when that's not allowed, in a movable ring situation, or when the shot clock sounds, among many others. Play should be stopped immediately when the team in control of the ring commits a violation. If the team not in control of the ring commits a violation, one of two scenarios occurs. A five second count begins, and play is stopped immediately if the violating team gains control of the ring during the five seconds. Otherwise, if the violation persists and the violating team gains control of the ring while it persists, play is stopped immediately. Please note that during a five second count, if the ring exits the zone where the violation occurred before the five second count has elapsed, the five second count is canceled. Looking at the crease, no skater other than the goalkeeper or an acting goalkeeper may enter the goal crease. Any ring on or touching the goal crease is considered in the crease, and no player other than the goalkeeper may contact it or control it. An attacking player taking a shot on net may not put the ring in contact with the goal crease while still contacting or controlling the ring. Doing so would result in a crease violation and possibly a nullified goal. We have to remember that the crease is 3D space. Even though it's only marked on the ice, the space it bounds extends straight up to the ceiling. Any time a player skates through the crease, puts their arm in the crease, or hovers over the crease in any way, it is a violation. That said, defending players will naturally, accidentally, allow their stick to overhang the crease while it is not on the ice. We refer to this as incidental overhang, and we would not consider this a violation. Delayed crease violations have a five second count that begins only once both the skater and the ring have left the crease. In this photo, rings number three, four, and five are considered to be in the crease. We can all tell that five is fully established inside the crease. Three is clearly on the line. And as we just discussed, a ring on or contacting the line is considered to be in the crease. Four is barely touching the line, but it is nonetheless contacting the line and therefore only eligible to be played by the goalkeeper. 
It is a fundamental rule in Ringette that the ring must be passed across each blue line. This is to encourage teamwork and ensure that everyone gets to play the ring. Importantly, the last player who contacted the ring before the ring crosses a blue line may not contact or control the ring until someone else does. But they also may not check a player from the other team who is going to get the ring until an eligible player successfully contacts or controls the ring. Remember, the blue line itself is neutral. This means that it is considered to be in both zones. A ring on or touching the blue line can still be played by the player who last contacted or controlled it, so long as they aren't the first to contact or control it when it is fully in the next zone. In addition to what we just learned, the blue line is also restricted to the goalkeeper. The goalkeeper is given the ability to throw the ring from within the crease to keep the game flowing in the defending zone. However, they may not throw the ring across the blue line. If they do so, their entire team is ineligible to play the ring in the neutral zone for five whole seconds. That said, the goalkeeper can pass the ring across the blue line from within their crease so long as they do so with their stick. When an acting goalkeeper has taken up position in the crease, they may not pass the ring over the blue line in any way. A team may not make a direct pass from their defending zone to their attacking zone. The ring must be contacted or controlled in the neutral zone before entering the attacking zone. If the ring is contacted but not controlled by an ineligible player, then a delayed violation is signaled. When the team eligible to play the ring finally contacts or controls the ring, the on-ice official begins a 5-second count. If a player from the team ineligible to play the ring checks an opponent before an eligible player has contacted or controlled the ring, a delayed violation is signaled. When the team eligible to play the ring finally contacts or controls the ring, the on-ice official begins a 5-second count. If the ring travels untouched from the defending zone into the attacking zone, the team eligible to play the ring has the responsibility to send a skater directly to the ring without delay to play the ring in a reasonable time. If they do not, the ring becomes playable by either team. This is our first introduction to the responsibilities that the rules infer on players or teams. The restricted area limits the number of skaters that can play in this area. In general, each team may only have up to three skaters in the restricted area at any given time. In our stationary positions, the free play line official's responsibility is to monitor the number of players from each team that have entered the restricted area while the ring is in the end zone. When the free play line official notices that a team in control of the ring has too many players in the restricted area, they will blow their whistle and signal 4 in, or 3 in, or 5 in, or 6 in, depending. When the free play line official notices that a team not in control of the ring has too many players in the restricted area, they will signal a delayed violation. If the excess players remove themselves from the area, the free play line official will begin a 5 second count. If this team gains control of the ring at any time during the delayed violation and the 5 second count, the free play line official will stop play and signal the violation as discussed. Now there are some exceptions here. When a team has pulled their goalkeeper, they are permitted to increase the number of skaters they play in either restricted area to 4. However, when a team is serving two or more penalties, they may have no more than two players enter the restricted area in their defensive zone, but they may still play three skaters in their attacking zone restricted area. There are more exceptions and nuances to this rule that you should familiarize yourself with over time. This situation can become a penalty or a penalty shot. Note that players may exchange at the free play line. For example, one exits and another enters. They may do so through a legal exchange where the player entering does not do so until both skates of the exiting player are at least contacting the free play line. It is important that the rules of ringette create an environment that prioritizes safety for the players and keeps the game moving. As such, any time the ring becomes immovable or otherwise unsafe to play, 
the on-ice officials should stop play. Let's note that immovable does not mean not moving. It means that the ring is very unlikely to get out of its situation and be passed to another player. For example, if both teams have the stick in the ring and neither team will clearly win that battle. Or alternately, the ring carrier has been swarmed along the boards, is being checked by everyone, and has nowhere to go. Those are two examples of the ring being immovable. In the case of two sticks in the ring, the ring is awarded to the team that was second to get control. If the ring became immovable or unsafe to play through checking or swarming, the ring goes to the team that was not in control of the ring. There is more to this rule. Active checking plays a role in deciding who gets the ring. You can learn more from your rulebook. This brings us to our second responsibility. The ring carrier must keep the ring movable and safe to play in all situations. For the last violation that we'll cover in this section, let's talk briefly about the shot clock. In games with a shot clock, teams have only 30 seconds to take a shot on net or lose control of the ring. Therefore, these games will be furnished with two shot clocks and a shot clock operator. New officials can expect the shot clock operator to take responsibility for managing the clock countdown and resets. When the shot clock alarm sounds, the net official will blow their whistle to stop play and award the ring to the team that did not have control at the time. Moving on to penalties. Penalties penalize players and teams for infractions contrary to permitted behavior and safety in ringette. Penalties result in players serving time in the penalty box and their team playing shorthanded on the ice. Also, importantly, their defending zone restricted area becomes further restricted as the rules require that at least one skater remains outside of the restricted area when the team is penalized. There are seven types of penalties in ringette. We will now cover them in their order of severity. The minor penalty is the most common penalty in ringette. It results in two minutes served in the penalty box. If a goal is scored against the penalized team, the penalty may be cut short depending on other factors. Next we have unsportsmanlike conduct. Unsportsmanlike conduct penalties are issued when player or team staff behavior is unbecoming of a sportsperson. This penalty results in two minutes fully served. Fully served penalties cannot be cancelled by a goal. Major penalties are assessed when a minor penalty infraction is performed in both a deliberate and aggressive manner, or when a minor penalty infraction is performed recklessly. Most contact penalties result in a major penalty when contact is made first from behind or to the head, and all major penalties result in four minutes fully served in the penalty box. You should note that there are other reasons for major penalties that are not covered here. Refer to your rulebook for more information. Misconduct penalties are assessed for verbal conduct unbecoming of a player or bench staff. Misconduct penalties are usually assessed when this behavior has persisted beyond unsportsmanlike conduct or after a warning for behavior has already been issued. Misconduct penalties result in a game ejection and a two-minute fully served penalty being served by a teammate. They may result in a further suspension, but this is up to your local governing body. Match penalties are assessed for acts performed with an intent to injure. They can also be assessed for excessive verbal abuse. Match penalties result in a game ejection and a four-minute fully served penalty served by a teammate. They may result in a further suspension, but again, this is up to your local governing body. Penalty shots are assessed primarily when a penalty is performed that takes away a clear scoring opportunity. No time is served unless the infraction would normally result in a fully served penalty. When a penalty shot is called, the opponent gets a free shot on net. For more details on the many scenarios that can result in a penalty shot, consult your rulebook. And finally, we have awarded goals. Awarded goals are exceedingly rare, to the point that you will probably never be witness to one. They are assessed in specific instances where a penalty is performed that takes away a guaranteed goal. 
You can learn more about them in your rulebook. In the category of minor penalties, we have 13 specific penalty calls to make. They include body contact, boarding, charging, cross-checking, delay of game, elbowing, high sticking, holding, hooking, illegal substitution, interference, slashing, and tripping. Full details of these penalties will be discussed in a future clinic, but you can learn more about them in your rulebook. A prohibition on forceful body contact is a foundational philosophy in ringette. Body contact penalties should be assessed based on how play was impacted and the following four principles. 1. Every player is entitled to occupy any vacant space on the ice. 2. Every player has a responsibility to avoid body contact. 3. A player may move to vacant ice provided that the player does not initiate contact with an opponent and moving opponents are given an opportunity to avoid contact. We will often discuss this principle as the principle of time and space. Did a moving player allow for sufficient time and space with their opponent such that both players could avoid body contact? Number four. A player who recognizes a situation where contact might occur must attempt action to avoid it. If you recognize it, it's not okay to let it happen and hope that it will draw a penalty. It could result in a penalty to the seemingly less guilty party if the official believes that they were aware and did nothing to prevent it. Our last topic in rule fundamentals is penalty management. This section covers how penalties are served, how they affect the game on the ice, and some other points. As I've already explained, teams play shorthanded on the ice while serving penalties. Only up to two penalties per team can be served at the same time. As a result, when teams end up with more than two players in the penalty box, these excess players are penalized, but they have to wait for other penalty time to run out before theirs can begin. When a team has three or more players serving penalties, players may not exit the penalty box until enough penalties have ended that their team would be permitted a fourth or fifth player on the ice. However, if a stoppage in play occurs, players who no longer have penalty time to serve may leave the penalty box. While minor penalties can end if a goal is scored against the penalized team, if the number of penalized players on each team is the same, or if the team scored against has fewer players penalized than their opponent, no penalty is cancelled. If a penalty shot is to be taken, the on-ice officials must communicate with the two players involved before the shot. Explain to the shooter that they will begin with the ring and must skate directly to the net and ensure that their body and the ring always move in a forward trajectory to the net. Meanwhile, the goalkeeper must understand that they must start in the crease and remain there until the whistle blows to start the play. If they commit a penalty that prevents a clear shot on net, the penalty shot will result in a goal awarded to the shooter. This concludes our discussion of the basic fundamental rules of ringette. I want to take this opportunity to again remind you that this video is a primer that covers the material that a new official is expected to learn and know as they begin their development path. There remain many exceptions or nuances above and beyond what was discussed today and other rules that we have not even touched upon. You will learn them all in due time. For those of you watching this video module as part of your level one clinic, your next steps are to attend your clinic seminar, review the new officials manual, which documents much of the material from this video and more, complete the new official exam, and then go and do your first game. Good luck.